Hi, everyone. So uh, we'll get started. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining. I think um, for this particular topic, actually, 30 minutes isn't enough. So I'm just going to give you a whirlwind introduction to kind of things you should think about when you're launching a new open source project, um, which um, and uh, kind of getting things going. So with that, uh, just a little introduction on myself. I'm, uh, my name is Trishan Delandrol. I'm with the Linux Foundation. Been there now six years. I, I run some of their networking projects with a particular focus in uh, data plane acceleration, open radio access networks, and stuff like that in that space. Um, and I've helped kick off several projects at the LF, not just in networking, but even in some of the statistics languages. And uh, when I first joined, I actually helped uh, launch the UOV uh, open source UOV program as well there. And, you know, how are we going to spend the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes here? Uh, since it's a, it's a smaller crowd, so we could feel free to interject with any questions and keep it interactive. Uh, so we're going to dive in, uh, give you a quick intro. I think you heard from uh, Gab Gabriel this morning about sort of the importance of open source from a corporate strategic perspective, so I'm going to skim over that a little bit. And then we'll kind of go into some of the considerations that you might want to take into account as you build your, or as you decide you're going to contribute to an open source project, or if you're going to start a new open source project, bring a project to uh, a nonprofit like Phenos or the Linux Foundation, and, uh, and then kind of interject that with some good best practices that you should um, take into account here as well. With that, uh, the, the old, I think, the field of dreams movie <laughs> reference, you, you build it, they will come. Go throw your open source program on a GitHub and expect to build a community around it. Probably not. It's not going to work that way. Uh, you just be lost in the, the forest there. And you've got millions of projects up on GitHub. So the key to these, the building an open source, a sustainable open source project is to build sort of that ecosystem and a community around it. So... So projects like the Linux kernel, when they got going, we had, uh, it takes more than just throwing the source code, as you know. Um, it, it is, you need to build a sustainable ecosystem around it. You, so you build a community of developers that can contribute to the project. You have products and solutions that are built on it. You kind of, you test that if you see around here, some of the companies here working on phenos based projects. And then you continually improve uh, on that code base with bug fixes and security updates and, and things like that as well. For the enterprise, uh, as in this note's keynote, we mentioned it's now, uh, it's, it's actually in, for your business strategy, you kind of take into account open source and build out open source projects within it. And as I said, everyone kind of takes it at lip service, oh, we're gonna build an open source project, but what does that really mean? Uh, and when you're looking at it from a strategic perspective, you kind of look at it at the high value, is you're trying to increase your market opportunity uh, while kind of building an ecosystem and products. You're decreasing your costs by uh, collaborating on the development, reducing your risk in that sense too, because now you have to invest less to, to build your project and product around it. And by collaborating and building and building that ecosystem, you are in turn sort of building the de facto standard that people would then base their solutions on. Uh, case in point, if you look at Kubernetes and the container space, that becomes like the one that everyone is going and building on if you want to do containers. And as I mentioned, the project is just the first step. You get the, the, to build that project, you kind of go in a cycle, so, and you go into products, deployments. Eventually, you get to profits. It takes sometimes a, a couple of years to build. So you won't have a successful open source project in year one. You might be collaborating. You take Phenos, for example. It's grown over the last several years, three to four years that it's taken it to get to this stage. And it's still continually growing. Um, and then you build the, the developer community around the program as well. So what does it take to build uh, a successful ecosystem? Basically, you could think of it, uh, break it down into four key areas. Neutrality, having that forum to collaborate and, and work together. And, um, uh, 
the uh, open governance model, clearly laid out charter rules, a uh, set of ground rules that you can play by, and uh, uh, clarity around IP ownership, that's the licensing for the software, who's contributed what and how you can use it, and then building out that ecosystem, which is to engage, kind of encourage the commercial engagement in the project and building it to uh, recruiting channels and opening it up to recruiting channels, adoption, and then improving contributions in terms of features and, and new developers and contributors and use cases as you build out the applications. To have a successful open source ecosystem requires a lot of resources. It's, as I said, it's at the beginning here, it's not just throwing your source code up on GitHub. This event is a good example of that, getting as an opportunity to get the community together and work. Legal, you're looking at license scanning your software, any uh, issues that might come up as you're working through it, and governance questions, uh, training programs, certification programs, the Finos just announced their the training just yesterday, I think. Um, testing certification, compliance programs around your pro software as you build that out. And uh, you won't have an ecosystem if you don't engage with your developers and listen to them. So you want to have avenues and channels to bring in contributors, companies, uh, engineers to come in and work on your projects. And they need a place to work. So you need to have the uh, CI CD infrastructure in place. And what, what does that look like as you kick things off? Uh, as well as then considering security. These days, security is a big consideration on how do you address security vulnerabilities and issues quickly, how do people report them in, and then how do you do like uh, software bill of materials around your program as well, and then manage on that supply chain side of things, which has become a critical factor these days as well. So let's look at, uh, going forward, let's break down, spend the next couple of minutes kind of looking at the different areas and we'll break it down. So we're gonna start with sort of the governance what are the policies that you might want to take into consideration as you build your program or decide to contribute to a project? If you're contributing to a project, you should take a look at their project's charter, see how well documented it is, how will they good documentation around it? Uh, what's their uh, process? You know, what are the rules, of the rules of the road, so to speak? And then the development process, life cycle, release process, what, what sort of infrastructure is in place for that? and an ecosystem and uh, intellectual property. So let's dive in. I know uh, we're gonna go in quickly. So we'll go through this quickly and then my slides are available on Sketch. So you're welcome to download these uh, and there'll be like little checklists that you can then use. So what does this governance model look like for <laughs> a well-run open source project? This, are we gonna, this is an example of a smaller scale project which has a governing board which is responsible for the sort of strategy and uh, finances around the project. A technical steering committee is given a car blanche on the technical direction of the project and they work on the technical and you have technical steering committee members. They could be from the governing board but eventually it becomes a meritocratic process where the engineers that are, I mean, the developers that are serving on the TSC uh, come up based on their merits and the contributions that they made to the project. And then within that, you might have working groups uh, for marketing events, finance, and then if you have a compliance program, you can build that out with, uh, with your community labs and open labs that you might set up. And then if you want to look, so this is just as a simple example of a governance, but let's take a look at the, uh, what a umbrella project might look like. So this is a large scale project which has large sub projects underneath it. And we have multiple technical steering committees uh, that would then report up to sort of a technical advisory council. And then you'll have a broader marketing advisory council to develop your marketing programs. You're looking at cross-project collaborations, convergence infrastructure that might work across different projects, uh, and then large-scale developer testing forums and events that you might have. And then uh, as you build your program out and mature it and you get more end users, you start an end user advisory group to look at new use cases and, and future, uh, look kind of a forward-looking uh, group. Uh, 
Uh, and then, as you all said, the governing boards, they are working on their budget. And then the, the TSCs, uh, again, they are managing the technical direction of the particular projects. Uh, feel free to jump in with any questions. Um, okay. Oh, these are just, um, this is an example from LF Networking, and these are some of the project names. Uh, ODL is Open Daylight, and a project like that, yep. So what should you consider when you're looking at the governance on a project? Um, so this, as you said, sets the ground rules. First off, what's your mission scope for your project that you're building? The guiding, what are your guiding principles for your community? What brings your community together on that? And that's what you might want to have that laid out up front. Um, your, the composition for your technical steering committee, your governance structure, the responsibilities, you lay out your voting structure, uh, your intellectual property, your IP licensing, you know, is your software that you're releasing on the Apache? BSD, GPL, what, what's your contributor? Do you use a, a DCO, a developer contributor agreement, or um, do you use a CLA, a contributor license agreement format? And you define your technical community roles, your committers, contributors, reviewers, uh, and how, you might, how they might contribute to the project. And then you have a life cycle um, how do you take a project, a new project that maybe co comes in, if you're an umbrella, from uh, an incubating stage to a sunset stage? Like, what stage does a project look like it's reached sunset? And, um, and then where would you allocate resources? And importantly, it's also good to have a code of conduct. As folks here who signed up for this event too, this event itself has a code of conduct. So you want to have a good code of conduct um, that you can refer back to for your community, and there are plenty of examples of good code of conducts online uh, for open source projects. Okay. Uh, the DCO is sort of a developer contributor. Uh, that's an agree uh, con agreement that people sign off on when they're contributing code. It's a sign off line that you put into your, your Git uh, commits. Uh, now you, you kind of take in, okay, I'm planning this new project. I've got some funds. How do I spend it? And it's important to know how to allocate your funding. And so these are some of the financial considerations that you would want to take into account. As I said, the uh, intellectual property, uh, as you're building your brand for your open source project, you would take into account your trademark, your, the licensing, export compliance rules, uh, if you need to do export compliance, uh, license scanning. Um, do you have a leadership team that you want to build out? Do you have someone, do you have a marketing communications PR person? Do you have an executive director if you are a standalone uh, organization, uh, program managers and leads? And uh, how much do you want to spend on events, like this event um, for uh, developer get-togethers to simple events to meetups? It should just be as simple as uh, pizza boxes and uh, uh, company-sponsored space that folks can work in, or uh, in this day and age, uh, virtual Zoom meetups and webinars. Um, and then as your project grows, you should start thinking about certification programs. What does it mean to be, say, powered by your project or be running on it? Compliance programs, uh, training, documentation, and then uh, the, a big chunk of, usually a big chunk of the budget kind of goes for IT and infrastructure costs. Uh, that is when you have build servers and stuff. I have, a, I'll kind of follow up on that here. And then the other area that you might want to consider that people forget is Upstreaming and cross-project collaborations. So are you working with the stand, are you impl implementing a standard? How do you work with that standards body? Are you uh, pulling in source code from a dependency, an open source dependency that you're using? How do you collaborate with that open source dependency? Are you fixing a bug that comes in? Are you forking it and then working on it in your own project? Or can you kind of upstream that back to the project? Um, so, and if you need to budget for it, it's good to kind of have that uh, front and center as well. So, as I said, now you've got uh, your mission scope, you've got your project idea, you've started to pull your code together here, and you're getting ready to, to work on your project. Uh, 
So how do you get your code prepared? So in an ideal state, you want your license. Make sure it's a, a, a OSI compliant open source license, approved license for your project. It's got the, uh, the permissions, you know, uh, you've laid it out, you've got a license file in your source code, and you've got <coughs> uh, SPDX uh, license tags as well, you know, in your files, so that when you do a license scan, you can find all your, your files that are in compliance or not. And I've seen for projects where we've got, oh, here's a big contribution. Uh, recently, we, we got a new contribution for a project, <laughs> and uh, the folks that submitted it, it was, had no license files in it. So we had to hold the, the, the contribution back and say, okay, you need to go back and put the license information in and so we can actually uh, kind of clean up, clean that up before it is accepted. Uh, yep. Uh, the documentation, as I said, the SPDX, tagging the code correctly. Um, and then it's, it's so that those are machine readable tags for your licensing. Put the right copyright notices in on the, the document and the website. And then finally, you can run um, uh, license scans on your code uh, to kind of catch those, uh, any issues around that as well. And Fossology is one of the free, uh, tools that is available uh, that you can use uh, as a sort of a, a first pass. And the DCO, this is the one I was mentioning, is the, DC, uh, the developer certificate of origin, which uh, it kind of captures uh, provenance at time of submitting the code. It's just a little sign-off statement that says signed off by name at an email. And it's, uh, it's enforced, particularly in, in, you can enforce it in Git, Garrett, and, and GitHub and the environments in the GitLab as well. And as you're going through, um, we have the, the CII, which is the uh, core infrastructure initiative, has this badging program. And I encourage, if you're working on an open source project, is to pull up uh, the CII criteria, which gives you a large checklist of things and best practices that will let you kind of see at a glance, like, are you really following these best practices? And it's good to kind of check them off as you go, and it gives you like a sanity check. And, and we've encouraged for our projects, uh, we've encouraged them to all apply for and get a CII badge so that you can say, okay, you, you know, you're doing the documentation correctly, you've got security response processes in place, you've got um, good commit practices and stuff like that. Speaking of security, <laughs> that's your uh, security disclosure procedures. This could be as simple as having a private mailing list for a subgroup that will focus on get, uh, getting any security reports that come in and then taking action on those to uh, writing up a CVE case and publishing that as well out there. So just have that process in mind and from the get-go. So development infrastructure. Uh, when you're considering the development side of things, as I mentioned earlier, kind of consider upstreaming first. Because say you have uh, a dependency and there's a security vulnerability that is uh, identified in a dependency. Now, what's your process to bring that back into your project? Um, if you found an issue in a, an upstream project, did you contribute it back to them to address it so that it doesn't replicate when you go to a new version of the software? Um, so consider working upstream with, with that project community. It'll lower your maintenance, and then um, the code, your contributions, you become more of an active participant out in the ecosystem uh, with your changes that you can, you kind of become a good citizen that way as well, uh, building that relationship with the other communities. And in a, in a selfish way, it takes the onerous off of your plate to maintain it by pushing it back up to the, uh, the upstream project that you're using as a dependency uh, as well. And then you, you kind of also build some skills uh, working on these different projects. The, so this is just an example of what a sort of a typical CI CD model for a, a workflow might look like as a, you come in as a contributor on a project, you 
your codes up there on GitHub or Git, you sign your DCO, you submit a patch. Uh, we have build servers that might build it, do the dependency tree and build it up. And then you have a code verification, you have the reviewers that are plus two, meaning they'll, there'll be two people reviewing, they'll approve it. And then the code gets accepted into your source code management system. And then you merge it, and then you might have a build artifact for a release uh, that you might push out as well. And these are just some of the tools that, that we use on one of my R projects and, as an example. Uh, for those who are submitting uh, patches and submitting code, uh, some good ideas, and this is a bit of an eye chart, but it's um, basic gist of it is make sure you've documented your code, you've got good, when you put a git commit, you really clearly say what you're committing and why you're committing it. Uh, if it's addressing an issue that's in your issue tracker, you tag it, and, uh, and if there are any comments, you address those things as well. Uh, usually, and you should rebase it to the head of your code um, and then submit the code as well. And then general uh, good coding practices. If you are programming, just make sure you've sectioned off, alph alphabetized your import statements, your functions organized. Uh, make sure you have your tests for the software. That, that's a key criteria when you, when you accept anything that's submitted to your project. And then do you have the documentation and then do you, you know, have you passed sort of uh, linting, which is verifying the quality of the code that's being submitted as well. And, um, and then if you have any backward compatibilities, you kind of take that into account. So as you do this within your project and you're building your project, we mentioned the stages. You kind of start either as a user or an adopter as a, on a project, or you come on and then you're, you, you could, or a contributor, then you become a trusted committer with access, to, uh, with keys to the, uh, the Git Garrett repo, you become a reviewer, and then eventually you might be one of the main maintainers of the project. So you kind of earn your trust by uh, contributing to the project as well. Now you have the code, you have your budget, your finances, and then you want to really start working on getting to know your community and building out the the community, get to know who you're part working with. One key here is, you know, you really want to listen to the community and the contributors. Uh, and even if you have some ideas of how you want to run your project, you might, you still want to have that forum in place that you can listen to people and collect the feedback. So some do's and don'ts on this. Get to know your folks, subscribe, have the communication channels like your mailing lists and your IRC channels or Slack these days, Z um, Zoom meetings, weekly community meetings. Um, ask questions, listen, and then offer to help. <laughs> and actually, usually, don't forget to read the manual. Um, and then, as and just assume your way is better. Just always kind of take into account what others think. And uh, and then it goes without saying, uh, don't be an a-hole in the community. The other piece of it is when you're out there doing these projects, uh, contributing or trying to build a new project, don't drop like huge patches and expect them to get integrated into a project. You want to piecemeal it, have it in smaller pieces, make it easier to digest, and uh, don't do drive-by coding. You know, you might be encouraged, oh, I have this module, I think this will work here without talking to the community and asking for feedback and then just coming and dumping a million lines of code uh, into a project. They, you, folks in the community will not be happy with you. Um, so bring it in pieces, encourage, get, uh, start a dialogue, get a conversation going, get buy-in, and, and then uh, you can start uh, uh, contributing to the project. And uh, sort of also keep in mind when you're building, the, working on a pro project or a community, uh, keep, Keep, it, keep the whole picture in mind and see what the direction, going back to the mission and vision of the project and seeing how your contributions might fit into that uh, broader scoping as well. As you build your project, these are some areas, and this is an example from an existing project, things you might want to get started uh, and have as ch uh, communication channels within your, for your community of engineers. Your technical steering committee, weekly calls, uh, having your mailing lists, 
uh, doing plug fests or hack fests with the community, uh, contributing to documentation, encouraging contributions on that front, having an end user advisory group for end users to engage who are not necessarily contributing code, uh, have a clear path for submitting bugs and issues. Um, and then if, as your project goes, you might have little user groups in different parts of the world and different time zones uh, to work in. Um, one of my projects, we ended up, without even realizing, we ended up with a Japanese localization group that was working on a Japanese language version in, and they were contributing that back. Uh, define the compliance, as I said, the uh, test cases, and then review and submit your codes there. Um, don't forget to market and promote your project because you might have the world's best software that does something, but nobody knows about it, nobody will care. <laughs> so you need to build out some thought leadership around your project, uh, figure out how you can get the news out, press releases, uh, social media uh, communication, uh, having PO, uh, proof of concepts, demos that you can push out there uh, at events like this or other uh, expos, and then have use cases, white papers that you can publish on that front, and then speaking opportunities to talk and share your body project and get folks involved. And yeah, uh, sort of finally, to I mean, as we wrap up, open source is a team sport, so when you get working with the community, kind of keep that in mind, listen, collect feedback, and then uh, kind of collectively move forward with, with the community and the project. Uh, just as a summary wrap up, if you're kicking off a new project, uh, as we mentioned, get your internal alignment, uh, prepare the code base and the assets and get that out, and then really work on, concentrate on the building the ecosystem part of it. Uh, on, and don't forget the marketing and promotion security aspects of your project as well. Some resources for those who are looking for best practices. Um, the to-do group uh, shares, uh, for, especially if you have an open source office, they have, some, they, they have best practices and documentation and guides at the to-do group. And then around uh, community building, there's the uh, People Powered from John O'Bacon. Uh, it, it's an old school book, but there, it is a physical book that you can flip through, um, uh, that you can use. And it's an e-book too. Um, yep, and I'll just leave you with this. As I mentioned, uh, you have your source code and you're building it, uh, and then you kind of have that neutral governance that you're putting it in, and then you build a virtuous cycle with your project and neutral governance, uh, bug fixes, community development, and then your products. With that, yeah, just a, a quick acknowledgement to the team that helped me with some of the slides here. And uh, questions. And you can feel free to re each email me directly if you have follow-up questions on this as well. Uh, so I know I'm standing here between you and lunch. Uh, yes, I uploaded it on Sketch. So the, the slides on on there already. It's equivalent, but it depends on the license that you're you enforcing as well. So, for example, uh, you know you have Apache licenses which have that. So I'm going to prefix this. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> With the but you have the Apache license that has a CLA template for it that you can use the CLA because of the the um, the way it uh, it has the patent grants in the license. And then you have things like BSD licenses which don't really use a CLA. They use just the DCO. Uh, for how they approach it. So it really depends on um, on what license the software is released under and then which mechanism is easier. Uh, from a use case, use perspective, the DCO is a simple, simple process and there are other projects that actually cover and have both. So you sign a CLA once and you put that in the system 
and then you every commit comes with a DCO sign off as well. So, so the CLA is just a one time, sometimes a one time thing, and you can manage it as well. Great. Yeah. No, you should have something on the sign off. Yeah. So it makes it easier to trace back who, the contributions and stuff. It's more for the contribution side. Great. Uh, I think I'm on at time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>